you were to ask me to name the most influential cartoons of all time, Ren and Stimpy would definitely be somewhere at the top of that list. Without Ren and Stimpy, there wouldn't be a SpongeBob SquarePants, Adventure Time, or even Rick and Morty. The Nickelodeon cartoon about a mean dog and a dumb cat was a landmark for modern animation with its gross-out humor, incredible animation quality, and achieved pop culture superstar status the moment it debuted in 1991. Today in the Hyper Room, I welcome Thad Komarowski, the author of Sick Little Monkeys, the unauthorized Ren and Stimpy story, which is a highly enjoyable deep dive into the creation and history of the much beloved or much execrated cartoon series, depending on who you ask. Some key points you'll hear that you won't believe. Ren and Stimpy at one point beat the Simpsons in the ratings. Gendy Tartakovsky was such a fan of the show, he hired as many of the original Ren and Stimpy team as he could for Samurai Jack. And the shocking revelation in a 2018 BuzzFeed article that the show's creator, John Crisfalusi, was involved in adult relationships with underage fans of the show. This conversation with Thad has it all. Sex, betrayal, an out-of-control creator, everything except an actual murder. And yes, I am talking about a cartoon show. Take that, Rugrats. I love the book and encourage any animation fan to read it. The story of Ren and Stimpy is almost crazier than the show itself. Well, almost. So join me and author Thad Komarowski inside the Hyper Room. The Hyper Room. The Hyper Room. In 1991, we first meet Anthony Hopkins' version of Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs. We see American Kevin Costner as Robin Hood, and the final film with the entire original Star Trek crew flies off into the undiscovered country. X-Men number one and X-Force number one sell a combined 12 million comics for Marvel and make superstars out of Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System is released into the North American market alongside games like Battletoads, Final Fantasy IV, and Sonic the Hedgehog is released on the Sega Genesis. Nickelodeon was founded in 1977, but decided this year to launch original cartoons under the Nicktoons banner. Thad, talk a little bit about what's your experience or understanding of the Nickelodeon business? They've been around for so long, but all of a sudden they decided to get into the original cartoon business? Well, for the longest time, as one of the artists told me, it was just this low-budget place that threw green shit at each other. And just for, for the longest time, it was a rerun depot, you know, just all old content of older cartoons and live action TV shows. They do a lot of imports from the UK and Canada. And Jerry Laybourne, the main executive, she was very influenced by her husband, Kit Laybourne, who is an independent animator. You know, they, they're seeing what the animation industry is and they're like, Look, we, we've had it with these toy commercials and all these reprisals and endless reinventions of, you know, the same old thing year after year that all of the network television was offering, uh, CBS, NBC, and ABC. And, you know, it, it, it was a sort of a perfect storm because around 1988, Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out. And if you've read my book, you know I'm not a fan of that film, but I completely respect what it did for the industry. It was a huge wake-up call that, as one artist told me, you could actually make money off of this shit by doing something good. This is the period where Disney animation is starting to get its act together. They had been in, you know, a real dark rut since Walt Disney passed in 1966. They're starting to do hits again. And now with TV animation, you know, there really wasn't much of an outlet for original content. 1987 was when Ralph Bakshi, who was sort of his own character, you know, he blazed a lot of trails, but he didn't influence a lot with his adult features. But he's been pitching for years with this group of artists, some of whom were John Chris Felusi. And finally, they, they're trying to pitch original ideas. And so Ralph reaches into his memory bank. Well, let's do Mighty Mouse. You know, everyone wants to do reboots and Ralph Bakshi was brought up at Terry Tunes. That's where he started in the industry. And all of a sudden, you know, they get an order for 13 episodes of Mighty Mouse The New Adventures through Ralph Bakshi's company in April 1987, and they need to make the air dates in September 87. Ralph has John Chris Felici hire everyone he knows who's sick of the industry, 
just as much as he is, and you're finally just throwing all of this shit at the wall and seeing what sticks and what doesn't work. And that show is kind of unwatchable in 2020 standards. I mean, the animation is all over the place. But you can see all of the ideas that would take form in the various... You know, the thing about that show, Mighty Mouse, is everyone who played an important role either in Ren and Stimpy, The Simpsons, or... The Warner Brothers animation of the 90s all got their big break there. You know, you just follow the careers of all these people and it all their everyone will say their first creative big break was the Mighty Mouse show. So, it's worth looking at from a historical perspective for sure. And this was getting John K a little bit of notoriety. He had a falling out with Ralph Bakshi over creative control and he didn't come back for Mighty Mouse's second season. He went and did the infamous reboot of Bob Clampett, the famous Warner director who of course, if listeners may know, John K is obsessed with Bob Clampett. And he they did a reboot of Bob's show from the 60s, Beanie and Cecil, which only lasted about four and a half episodes. Uh, a lot of acrimony, if you read it in my book about it. Not just executives who didn't really want the show or those artists, but, you know, John K can't run a studio or a production. So that leads to that falling out. And so... John Kay, I should go back, had been burning bridges in the industry throughout the whole entire time he was in Hollywood. Uh, he came out to L.A. from Canada in 1979, and, you know, he, he just would stop showing up for work and stuff like that, or he just wouldn't follow orders at the factory houses like Filmation and Hanna-Barbera and Deke. And so he was basically out of work, and he's trying to get independent projects going. He started an illustration studio with his girlfriend at the time, Lynn Naylor, who you cannot understate her influence on the industry from a design standpoint, as well as Jim Smith, who would go on to become probably the most important draftsman on Ren and Stimpy. And a newcomer that John hit it off with right away, Bob Camp. He had been working for years in comics, and he came over to animation in, I think, 87. It's all a perfect storm. You know, this is when Nickelodeon wants to get into original production. Uh, they did a couple of one-shot specials, and then all of a sudden, you know, hey, we're looking for original ideas. They send the New York executive, Vanessa Coffey, out. she's going to be meeting with people, and nobody believed it for a second. And she, they specifically did not want to go with any of the other animation factories. They wanted smaller creators, smaller studios. You know, we, we want original content. We don't want to follow the status quo anymore. What age group was Nickelodeon targeting? The same as it is today, like little kids? They were targeting little kids, but they were trying to, you know, you know, they, they, they wanted to push boundaries a little bit. I think Ren and Stimpy was a real wild card for what they were after. I mean, if you look at the other shows, like Rugrats and Doug, which were the other two shows that premiered with Ren and Stimpy, that's a little more in the direction they were hoping for. But, you know, Ren and Stimpy was this show that I think I sum it up as in the book is a show that they wanted and didn't want. So just to go over that, this is a very important part of it because the Nickelodeon launch for the three shows, one of them was called Doug. It was about an 11-year-old boy with a big imagination. Then there was Rugrats, about three babies and their <laughs> daily lives and their huge imaginations. And then finally, somehow, the third show is about a cat and a chihuahua that may or may not have been the first gay couple created for a children's show. And it was, it was called Red and Stimpy. What kind of drugs were being used at Nickelodeon back then? And maybe also tell us a little bit about the original pitch that John K gave to Nickelodeon to get this bot in this kind of bizarre subset of shows. Well, I don't want to speak on record about which drugs, but th these were just, these people were ballsy. They wanted this guy to work with them initially because part of John K's gift is charming people into giving him what they what he wants. And so initially I was told by the late Carl Masick, if people are unfamiliar with him, he's he has his own history as far as importing anime. Carl Masick is the visionary and creator behind Robotech. And I also was interested in your book how their paths crossed at the yes. beginning. It's so interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting because, you know, Carl Masick was sort of functioning as a de facto agent for John K and Spumco, but they weren't really getting any work. I mean, Carl had told me that, like, one thing they would produce cells for cartoons that didn't exist with some of John's characters and try selling those to galleries. Carl claimed he had to beg 
Vanessa Coffey to take a meeting with them because at this point, Spumco had no production experience. Like they had, like Klesky Jupo, at least, you know, they had, they had been working for several years on different things. Like they'd been doing The Simpsons. They made Rugrats or Doug? They made Rugrats. Doug was mostly out of New York. I believe. And so John Kay, he gets really into a pitch. I mean, there's video online of him yeah. doing it. And he's, you know, he's just entices these people at Nickelodeon. They fly him out to New York and he does his pitch there. And Jerry Laybourne is like, hire this man, buy something from him. He's been pitching the same unsellable series for about 30 years, you know, centered <laughs> around George Licker, American, and Slab and Ernie, and all those other great characters. And it was part of a thing called Your Gang. And there was a dog and a cat in the pitch. You know, they're the pets. And Vanessa Coffey says, I kind of like these two guys. Why don't we try and do a series on this? And that's why John Kay was initially initially receptive to selling the rights whole hog to Nickelodeon for those characters because he didn't have a ton invested in them. There are some story treatments that exist with Ren and Stimpy, but they're very haphazard and very explicit. There's some similarities, you know, the defining trait of Ren is that, you know, he calls up people and tells them, I've kidnapped your baby, you know, things like that. And Stimpy was just this... Ver- version of uh, cats that appeared in a couple of Bob Clamp Tweety Bird cartoons. And, you know, it just started from there. They wanted to buy Jimmy the Idiot Boy, too. He had more of a on-PC name. I'm not going to say it, what it was there. It's 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 the R-word, Jimmy the R-word Boy. Oh. It was diff- different era. And yeah. they wanted that. They wanted that, too. But John Kay felt that had more potential. So they went with Ren and Stimpy. Masic parts ways right away because John Kay wanted him just to have a completely uncreative role in the process. And Carl Masic, as we know, was very creative in some of his decisions as a producer. So Yeah, at this time, Carl was already done with Robotech and he started Streamline to start bringing anime into America, right? Yes, he started that with Jerry Beck, uh, animation historian. So interesting. So who is actually to blame or to thank (laughs) at Nickelodeon? Is it Jerry Laburn, the president of Nickelodeon, or Vanessa Coffey, the Nickelodeon executive, to actually green light and get this whole thing agreed upon with John Kay? Well, you can't understate Vanessa Coffey. I mean, those three shows that initially launched Nicktoons have influenced more television animation than I can think of. But Vanessa was a real advocate for Ren and Stimpy because when the pilot came in, they didn't really want to go with it. But, you know, they, Vanessa was so convinced of John Kay's vision, you know, to bring back things to cartoony or cartoon roots of the golden age. And she said, look, you're giving everybody 13 episodes. Let's just do six. If it fails, you can fire me. And so they went on from there. So the book Sick Little Monkeys is now actually seven years old, but I just yeah. read it because it feels like 2020 is kind of a resurgence for Ren and Stimpy. There is uh, the Comedy Central announcement of a new Ren and Stimpy show, the documentary Happy Happy Joy Joy, which we'll discuss in a little bit. And also I'm a toy collector, so I saw that <laughs> Seven released some new action figures that are coming oh, out boy. this year as well. So maybe tell us a little bit, what is your relationship? <laughs> Why did you write this book about Ren and Stimpy and how do you know so much about it? As you probably have guessed i'm super obsessed with classical animation from the 30s 40s and 50s and this was its only real successor that i i was aware of where it tried to put everything back in the artist's control it, it tried to make the old style of filmmaking you know with the close-ups the long pauses everything work not so exposition heavy as so many modern cartoons are you know it it, it just felt right to me as a kid, you know, just as, as someone who poo-pooed everything except for Bugs, Bunny, and Popeye, and Tom and Jerry. And it, and I, did, I do love a lot of other cartoons from that era, but this is the one, this is special. And I kind of figured out it's because most of the people behind it are insane. But that is, the, that is what separates it. I mean, I mean, some people see it, uh, SpongeBob as the natural successor, but I, th- I I wrote in my book that SpongeBob is what Nickelodeon always wanted Ren and Stimpy to be, you know, a super yeah. silly fun show, but without 
all of the drama attached to it. I, I learned a lot about the animation business and the art form from reading your book. That's why I think that this is a still a good book to read about the whole industry. There's a big difference between The Simpsons and Ren and Stimpy in terms of animation style. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to watch both of them side by side today, I think even the layman could look at it and say, there's something different about these two shows, but you can't put the finger on it. It's like when I watched the um, Spider-Man 66 show. <laughs> right, the first seasons and then the batchy seasons. But you're like when you're a little kid, you're like, there's something wrong here. One of them looks like an acid trip, even though I don't know what acid is. But Simpsons is more like an on model kind of animation. Can you talk a little bit about you know the difference between these different kinds of animation? Well, for one, one is mostly about the art, and one is mostly about the writing. There's a big schism in animation between the artists and writers. If, you, if you're if you familiar with John Kay's works and words, he has a lot to say about that. Yes. And there's a little bit in the book. It's not necessarily true that one is more valid than the other. He says, if you can't draw, you can't work in cartoons, right? Yeah. So that means he had no little or no respect for writers, but he gave all the power to the animators. That's what I got. The number one message I got from your book about John Kay's personality. Well, where John Kay is coming from is years of resentment of the industry, how a lot of artists were treated with, you know, they divided everything into separate departments in the business. So no one's communicating with each other. And it's kind of how it is today. I don't mean to be mean. It kind mm -hmm. of has gone back to that route. But, you know, it, there really wasn't, you know, it, it was very ambiguous in the golden age, no matter what you read about. I, and I'm talking strictly American cartoons produced in Hollywood in New York City. You know, scripts were used back then. I mean, they're not, nothing comparable today where they're so rigorous or they're trying to describe crowd scenes and musical numbers as is very typical of a modern animation script. But, you know, there were cases where people were pounding out, pounding out scripts on typewriters deep into the 1930s. Storyboards weren't really in use until about wow. 34 or so. So, wow. but, you know, it's, like I said, it's a different, it's a completely different world and era, but it's sort of, they sort of worked out that, okay, the, it's, if we're going to be doing something be driven, we're going to be working with st try and put everything in the storyboards. I mean, the, the scripts were just easier to do. You know, it's easier to type out uh, Bugs Bunny goes over here than to draw it. It's got really rigid in the 60s. I mean, that's where the that's why that misinformation continued to spread that there were no scripts before the 60s, which is blatantly false. But, you know, it just got more hard minded and separate. And it made it easier for, you know, pretty clueless execs to read like which I've never gotten. It's like, well, how can you not read a board? Have you never read a comic book? You know, yeah. and that did, and there was a little bit of that in the production of Ren and Stimpy, but it was mostly because they weren't used to that style of cartoon making, especially John Kay's take on it. With The Simpsons, you know, it's there. It's some of it is visually driven because there are different styles between the different animation directors, like David Silverman and some of the others, and some of the different animation houses they use. I mean, because like you look at those chronologically, and you can see the difference right away. And not to blame names, but the things people really like about the early seasons of The Simpsons, I've come to learn, got phased out to match Matt Groening's taste. So interesting. I read the book uh, Springfield Confidential, so I, I got. Gotcha. It wasn't as in-depth as your book on the making of the show, but it did right. give me an insight into that. It was definitely writer-driven. They were all writing jokes super fast, and uh, then it was all sent to like overseas to animate, and it wasn't like – it was kind of like an afterthought. Whereas when I read your book, wow, the layout artist – is like drawing the keyframe of a scene and that thing had to be perfect mm -hmm. and was redrawn many, many times. Uh, right. It's just incredible to hear that. And then they <laughs> tried to animate as much as they could in the States, right? I think that's probably what led to any Ren and Stimpy actually existing, that a lot of it wasn't animated at John Kay's studio in Spumco because it, it just wouldn't get done. Most of it most of it was sent to Korea. Eventually, in the second season of the show, uh, Rough Draft became the flagship Korean studio, just as it sort of is today. Most of it, the best stuff was sent to Bob Jakes' studio in Vancouver, Carbuncle. And there were a few other places too, but they, they, you know, they can't, if you, if you read the book, it didn't work out or for, for various reasons. Like I said, with, with Ren and Stimpy, it really, it, 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 it 
it's not that people weren't good enough for it. It's just sort of that the industry wasn't good enough for it yet because there was one studio in Ottawa. It's gone through so many name changes and ownership by now. It was called Lacewood at the time. And Jamie Olaf, who eventually went and animated at Carbuncle, he was doing animation directing at Lacewood. And he told me, it's like, th- th- these people weren't ready for a show of the quality of Ren and Stimpy because he said, you know, put it bluntly, a lot of them were hacks. So they just weren't ready. I mean, you just can't throw a timing chart or just in between these poses that have so much energy and life and personality, you know, you, you need to treat this as somebody, you know, you need to be as thoughtful as a Disney animator, as polar opposites as those worlds are. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about John Chris Lucy, John yes. Kay. He seemed pretty calm in the, in the videos on YouTube, but in your book, he sounds like Steve Jobs animation. He is, uh, like if you've ever seen that movie, uh, Pirates of Silicon Valley, uh, Steve Jobs' uh, staff is typing code and then he rips the, uh, he rips the plug out of the, out of the wall. Right. And he's like, I didn't even save that. And I was like, <laughs> when I was reading your book, I was like, wow, this is, sounds very similar. <laughs> but he's also like a genius, an artistic genius. Well, see, and- I, I, I reserve the word genius for people that actually did good in the world, like maybe Einstein or Martin Luther King Jr. I do not reserve yeah, the word enough, genius yeah. for the arts. And John Kay is a principal reason why I don't like that word used as genius. Because, you know, if, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a genius, you know, you, you might be able to deliver something. Oh, I mean, figure that out. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, he, no, his, his gift. He was a, for a number of years. He was an extremely talented draftsman and story man. You know, just and all. And at the end of the day, with you know, you know, Chris, the late Chris Riccardi, who was a very important artist on the show, uh, says in one poignant point in that documentary, it's like nobody worked harder to fuck it up than John Kay did. Mm-hmm. And but the thing is, uh, it's a catch twenty two thing. His work really was in his mind. He's just trying to make the best show possible, and he just didn't think it would be acceptable any other way. And and you know, it's I do defend the shows after John Kay was kicked off the show, but you know, it, it it's lightning in a bottle. Those the first year and a half or so of the show. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting because a lot of people don't know, and I didn't know, but yeah, he got fired after mm-hmm. the first uh, season, basically. He was and a fired bit... during the second season. Okay, oh. he was fired during the second season, mm-hmm. and it goes to a company called Games Animation, which is owned now by Nickelodeon, and a lot of the key team from Move Over to mm-hmm. this, like Bob Camp and Lynn Naylor. Yeah, Lynn, but Lynn I... had broken yeah. up with John Kay during the production of the very first episode, and uh, there was a lot of acrimony there, and because Chris Cardi ended up dating her and then marrying her. And John Kay didn't like that. He, so Chris was gone. But Lynn came back to games specifically to work on characters that weren't Ren and Stimpy. So if you see episodes, <laughs> yeah, you see the episodes with her credits in it. There, There's a couple of one shots she and Chris Riccardi did. But they were are specifically without Ren and Stimpy because Lynn wouldn't work with them. So Lynn Naylor is she's not as famous as she should be because she's, she's on so many great shows. She's a Such very a shy individual. You would think oh. that someone you know this powerful drafts woman and designer you know would be a leader, leading yeah. voice, and she is in her own way because she's just doing she's just doing great work behind the scenes. Um, she's running a show at DreamWorks now, so they obviously got their act together. So if they gave her a show, and same goes for Jim Smith, who did stand up for John Kay. He's very soft spoken as well. You know, he just shows what he does with his amazing drawing ability. I mean, m- most of the key poses that are in like the most iconic poses of Ren and Stimpy are Jim Smith's drawings. Oh, so. interesting. So it's interesting to see then. So the series runs for another, what, four seasons from two to five at Games Animation. Bob Camp is now the director. Billy West is now the voice <laughs> of both Ren and Stimpy. Yes. And so what do you think? Does these new uh, seasons, do they pale in comparison to the original one? I mean, obviously people still love them. But people probably didn't even know there was a difference. What is your take on the the entire series after John K gets fired? I kind of view it as my friend Bob Jakes did, uh, who was the animation director on the first two seasons. It was kind of like John Lennon and Paul McCartney together in a part those seasons, you know, Bob Camp was the most important writer 
cartoonist mm-hmm. on that show. Mm-hmm. And so it retained a lot of the same flavor, but a lot of what John Kay brought to it with his personal madness, you know, it just wasn't there anymore. There, there's, I can still name like at least 10 or 15 episodes I think are very much worth anyone's time. And I will say that the art direction under Bill Ray and Scott Wills, it got much better in the post John K mm-hmm. years because they weren't trying to please him. They were doing uh, much bolder, better things in those years. Same with Chris Riccardi and Lynn. They did amazing work and a stylized design. And another un- underrated guy, uh, Mike Kim, did a lot of great cartoons that, you know, he told me specifically that he wanted to do stuff in the classic Spumco Stimpy's invention mold, where it's just about Ren and Stimpy. And he succeeded largely. But, you know, it's it became kind of like a typical cartoon and more of the mold of what Nickelodeon wanted it to be. And that's where I think the documentary really fails is they did, they just stopped. After John Case fired, they you know like oh it existed yeah. for another three years. Exactly. But then- That's why I like your book. It's like the it's like the sequel to the documentary. <laughs> but kind of because the only thing about reading a book, right, is like you don't get to see the people, you right. don't get to see their faces and the mannerisms and things like that. Like because you can learn a lot from how like some of them spoke, right, and how they right. work together. And you know, they're just doing it because they like to draw funny stuff, and you get that feeling. But you don't you can't really convey that in the written word. They're like good companion pieces together. But we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. What do you think, are then, looking back at them, are the purest form of Ren and Stimpy episodes? He's invention, for sure. That's that's okay. that's the masterpiece. Space Madness from the first season. See, a lot of people take me to task because I'm pretty critical of a lot of the issues yeah. with the first season. I mean, it's still monumental, but yeah. I really think it started to hit its stride in the second season. There's cartoons like uh, the infamous one that got him fired, Man's Best Friend, which I do think is a classic <laughs> Sven son of Stimpy Stimpy's first fart out west I think some of the other ones uh, rubber nipple salesman I watched all of those ones again after reading them, your specific breakdowns of them in the book so it's it's quite interesting when you mention them I watched it on like MTV or much music like I don't think we had Nickelodeon in Canada so right, I no. didn't see it so it didn't seem like it was like why is this on for little kids it just seemed like it was uh, approaching for like teenagers that's approach. the audience that ultimately found you know Vanessa Coffey was always talking about meeting the demographic but I kind of think they missed it with that I mean kids did love it but so did older kids and yeah. so did college kids I mean that's where I mean that's where it really took off because MTV ran it for a couple of weeks and and that's where it really exploded. The best part of the documentary is showing all that old footage at Golden Apple. Those aren't little kids. Those are all teenage nerds, yep. right? Like the comic books and image yep. comics and things like that right. at the time, right? Right. That was the period where people forget, you know, everyone, you know, I think in the wake of Junkie's scandal, everyone likes to like, oh, well, Ren and Snippy's old and that. And it's like, there was a period, at least one year, would have been 92, where Ren and Stimpy was the number one show. It was bigger than The Simpsons. So yeah. that was that made it off the charts. Like I, That took everyone by surprise. The only thing I, I always wonder about is they would submit the story, like John K. Spumco would submit the story, and then uh, Nickelodeon would come back and tell them, okay, we can do this, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. I remember the nipple story had to yeah. have rubber in front of it, things like yes. that, right? And uh, you know all these kind of weird things that a lot of things snuck through. And even in the book, the directors are like Bob Camber, like, I can't believe that this stuff got through either. Even for 1991, it's like already like risque. And then watching it today, it's still like, wow, this was on TV for children. Well, the first episode, Stimpy's Big Day, is all about cat litter. (laughs) I mean, that's pretty over the top. And what other place would let you do Stimpy's first fart on television? I mean, so that's, you know, there was a lot of, you know, executive meddling and interference. And I am of the belief that about 99% of executives are usually evil, you know. Yeah. But this was the one this was the one case where it, it was overblown. And cuz no artist likes being told what to do, but it's like, well, look at the kind of content you're producing and what is I mean, Will McRob, who was the main story editor, told me that you know, John K's response when something got rejected in the uh, outline stage is like, really? It's not like they're fucking or anything or getting dismembered. <laughs> I mean, that was his line, which <laughs> amazingly, considering what came later. That's, uh, that's, that's his yeah. bar, right? I yeah. think having cartoon characters have sex, that was like 
that's too much. Anything below right. it is okay for us. Even if anybody had any problem with it, Nickelodeon, it would it would rerun for years after the show had finished, right? right. So all that stuff is still out there offending people, but I guess there's no <laughs> internet, no internet out there for parents to complain about what was going because I can't imagine this stuff being out today in the current culture. But Spike TV is launching now in the turn of the century, in the mm-hmm. early 2000s, and they want to get that teen audience, right? They're looking for that young male audience. And so one of the ideas is to bring back Ren and Stimpy, and it's going to be called the Adult Party Cartoon. And for some reason, they have never heard the stories about John Kay and decide, we want this guy to come back and help us to make this. John Kay been doing in the middle in this whole time between the end of the show and this new... He's just been attacking old colleagues and other people in the industry (laughs) and, you know, doing his web cartoons and his comics. I mean, I mean, basically between 1993 and 2000 produced maybe about 10 minutes of content and they did the ripping friends, which was a huge failure for Fox. And, but then they started up a adult party cartoon. I believe Fred Seibert was instrumental behind the scenes. Seibert of Frederator and earlier of Cartoon Network. He was sort he kind of pulled some strings to get John Kay back to his creation. And yeah, they wanted to bring it back for prime time. And there was this idea in John Kay's head that, you know, this is going to be up against South Park. So, you know, we got to be as vulgar as possible. He he tries to spin it in the way he's a classic spin a doctor. And he liked to spin it that, well, the network told me to be as dirty as possible, which is true. But they didn't tell you to have Ren fucking Stimpy up the ass <laughs> in one episode. In fact, I have notes from the executive at Spike saying like I believe the first episode onward and upward it was a compl- well it's like it's it's a, it's a complete turkey I mean and they because everything was so late they kept rerunning and chasing people yeah. away because they had nothing else but that's right you know I, I remember specifically the note from the executive Kevin K of Spike TV saying like I really don't want to read the review that says they brought Ren and Stimpy back and they just made it grosser than ever Upward and Onward episode I read about in your book. I watched it. They are living in a homeless man's mouth and then they have to move out into a spittoon. I was like, this cannot be the what the story was about. Then I watched it. I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what it is. And that was written for the Nickelodeon series in 91. <laughs> that was that was also part of the thing. They were bringing back rejected story ideas from the Nickelodeon days, which... He's going to get his revenge on Nickelodeon. I'm going to I'm gonna make these shows no matter what one day. Well, well I think he's still thinks that but that's another story <laughs> but the fans of Ren and Stimpy did not like these adult party cartoons do you think do you, do you think he took it too far well I mean he still had his diehard followers trying to make it out you know it's 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 like with anything the 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 stupidest people are always loudest and yeah they're trying to make him out that they're better than they are but you know it's like nobody really likes these things they're getting panned by the critics. And plus, none of them are done, infamously. I mean, they li- they paid for all these shows, but they only ran three of them because they only got the sixth one like a year later. So what a way to run a business. This is the nadir. This is the nadir yeah. of creative talent gone awry, specifically why Nickelodeon set up games animation, which eventually became Nickelodeon Studio, specifically to do stuff under their control because which is not what they wanted to do vanessa coffee told me that was the antithesis of what they wanted to do they wanted to give it to other people but yeah. you know you've got this runaway train production and you've put millions into it you got to get it under control that's what i like about the book i love reading a book about something like the island of dr moreau right the, the product was is interesting but the behind the scenes is even more interesting oh. so while you were writing sick little monkeys what are some things that you maybe you learned that you didn't know before or that you were surprised when you found out well i got a lot more critical of the show because i'm looking at it with a keener eye and hearing you know this is why this doesn't work and usually with a cartoon or anything if something doesn't work it's not always because someone who did it was untalented although that sometimes is the reason but it might be because Oh, this this cartoon didn't work. Why? Oh, they didn't even storyboard it in the studio. That's a big indicator. Or, you know, they had a freelance 
timer do it or somebody who just didn't work out in the studio didn't you know even despite what the credits read and as i said before how unique the production of ren and stimpy was i mean character layout is really not done in tv animation anymore it used to be it's more expensive but now basically uh people have to do the layouts in the storyboard, which is the antithesis of what a storyboard should be. You're supposed to yeah. be conveying an idea and, and a plot and a story and storyboard, not framing the action perfectly and the acting perfectly. But I see all the time people are practically animating storyboards and before it goes over to a satellite studio in say canada or korea and it's funny because if i see on twitter like nickelodeon will tweet out oh on this day in history they'll show a spongebob animatic from the first or second season and i see artists there was maybe about there was maybe about 25 drawings for a minute that's unheard of now so so because uh, that's too many or too little too little now like i said they want you to do all the key poses they want you to do basic timing in the animatic and they want you to cut the animatic stage it's very cruel to the artists these days wow. but and that's where the advantage was with ren and stimpy i mean you could do exercise that much control and people like john k or chris riccardi usually did on their cartoons but now it really no i mean you just can i mean it's it's just too i'm trying to think of it how not to be mean but but if i'm being mean it's not towards any of the creative people it's towards the people that are making these decisions but it, it's just too much work i mean and eventually everyone gets burnout on every production like i i can't tell you how many horror stories i hear behind the scenes of you know whatever the latest hot topic is. so let's talk a little bit about the documentary happy happy joy joy i was hoping for a lot more and that's why it was so great that there's your book here that right. i could uh, read up on it you know it's just in short form like what are your thoughts on the documentary what was missing did they talk to you you about anything they come to you for any advice the doc makers did talk to me very early on they did interview me on camera i wasn't used oh. well i don't i don't I, I hold no personal grudge about that i mean if you want to cut people cut the people out who had nothing to do with the actual production or were involved I mean, I have no issue with that. But yeah, I think the main sin is that it's everybody's opinion about John Kay and not about Ren and Stimpy, which is ironic because for years, John Kay wouldn't even fart these guys' way. You know, but then he got exposed in that BuzzFeed article and all of a sudden he had a change of heart and you know like i said this is a guy who uses people charms them to get what he wants and he kind of did get what he want but it's also a catch-22 because you know he did allow them to reframe the whole documentary around his interviews but on, on the other hand i don't think anyone sane can walk away from this film having any admiration for him so you're telling me that you think John Kay is not very cooperative with people writing about him making documentaries writing books about him unless you know there's a, something in it for him to it's all, all about control with John Chris Felusi he needs okay. to control everything he everyone needs to think and act as they do I mean in the film mm. and in my book I, you know it was a cult essentially I mean everyone <laughs> yes. you know everyone's falling in line and and you know you know, eventually they get disillusioned with the Kool-Aid and, you know, break off one by one. I mean, even his most ardent supporters at the time he was fired in 92, you know, they all split off from him one by one. And mm. usually it, it, it happens within a couple of years. I mean, usually once somebody hits the age of 23 or 24, they've had enough of this guy. So I, I don't want to dwell on it too long, but the BuzzFeed article is yeah. a major point, I think. Yeah, like you said, because of that article came out during the production of the documentary it now becomes a centerpiece of it and the whole story changes and how do you separate the art from the artist well let me be honest i knew about a lot of this okay. i mean i didn't know the direct details I, one thing is you need consent of these people to talk about it i mean i know tons of dirty laundry i'm not going to about yeah. some of these people's personal lives but you know, it's just something you hear talking to these people and digging into it. I mean, it, it was pretty hard to miss with John Kay, I, which is the one virtue of the BuzzFeed article. I did get the, these women's consent 
to talk about this on record, which initially they didn't want to for years because, you know, his, you know, he's this Jim Jones type, you know, pe- people, you, you say anything critical about him, you know, you get attacked online. That's happened to me quite a bit, but, you know, I, I, I generally try to just blow it off, but I, I can imagine it was even, I don't have to imagine, I know it was horrible for all these people, you know, just what he what kind of a monster he really was behind the scenes with my book it made it clear that this guy is pretty unstable if they ever make this into a show or a movie i wonder who would play john k in, in that live action version i've actually been approached by different people like different filmmakers and stuff Good. like saying like yeah. how they're, they're interested in it but they want to make it fictionalized too many uh, families and too many lives that can be hurt from from all these stories getting out. Sure. Let's move on. Let's talk about Comedy Central announcing right. that along with, with Daria and Beavis and Butthead, more uh, refugees from the 90s are going to be coming back to TV. What are your thoughts? If, if I do know anything about it, I can't really say it. It did sound like it might have been put on the shelf. I mean, they seriously did want to do it. I mean, I've got to say, too, that this was completely separate from Nickelodeon. That's why they don't seem to know what they're doing. Mm. You know, because, like, I mean, I, I don't know if I should say who was working on it, but l- let's just say, like, an ex Phineas and Ferb guy was going to run it. And I, I don't even think Comedy Central would know enough that you don't do scripts with Ren and Stimpy. So there's another mark in its disfavor. I. I, I I really don't know what to say. I mean, it it's just a cash grab, and I always viewed I, I just viewed it as you know, well, this is the way this is the way they can make the first Google result for Ren and Stimpy, not the BuzzFeed article or Ren fucking Stimpy with a saw. So <laughs> I mean, it's it just as just a cynical cash grab, really, in this era of reboots, and pretty brainless too, because they've been doing some pretty tasteful reboots. Not not so much reboots, but new specials. Like they did the Rocco's Modern Life special with Joe Murray, the original creator. It was initially through Nickelodeon, and then it went on to Netflix, which I thought was very, very well done. And I would like to see that maybe done with Bob Camp with Ren and Stimpy, just a one-off mm. special. Yeah. I mean, at that and get uh, Bill Ray to do the art direction and Bob Jakes to do the animation. I mean, that that could be great. And I think it would give a lot of cathartic closure to this very poisonous story because it would allow these guys. I mean, we didn't talk about it, but anyone who worked on the show after John K. left was considered uh, an industry pariah for years. Oh, um, wow. Really? So, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, they, they stabbed him in the back. They took his baby away from him. Whereas yeah. I sort of always viewed it as, well, no. They took away your abused child and gave it to a foster. So, but <laughs> isn't the original Spumco team like? Aren't they like revered? I was just watching a Samurai Jack thing, awesome. and he had a he hired most of the Ren and Stimpy uh, crew. To- They're the best in the business. I mean, yeah. that's that's why any cartoon. I mean, I generally view the Simpsons and Ren and Stimpy as the most important cartoons ever made for television, mm-hmm. but. If you look at the crew list, if if anything holds up well, there's almost always at least three or four X Ren and Stimpy people in the credits. I mean, because you know they're just the best at what they do. And I tried to get that across in my book. I don't think the documentary was terribly successful at that because so much of it. I mean, I mean, look, most of our conversation has been centered around John K. I mean, you can't help it. But yeah. there were so many other people on that show, and people like Bob camp and bill ray they have their own points of views and their own artistic aims and egos and you know they're just interesting people in their own right and you know you you want to give them their due for what they brought to the show and other people like chris riccardi or jim smith or lynn naylor or oh god a ton of other people i'm getting but these guys and gals are just the best at what they do and why wouldn't you want to hire them well for a while they did have they were they were look these were animation's male contents and that's why they all formed at spump co <laughs> and once they had to go back into the real industry they had to get those attitudes beaten out of them but you know they're, they're still just making things great i mean i'm not the biggest samurai jack fan but it is a beautiful looking show and yeah. you know that's oh and and ganny karakowski was the biggest i don't think people really know this but he was the biggest john k sika fan for the longest time i mean with Dexter's lab, I mean, it, it, yeah. Dexter is basically Ren. 
and the pilot of Dexter's lab is basically Stimpy's invention. Oh so, my god, you're right. So, but but he went on to do his own style and thing, and but and naturally he wanted to bring in Ren and Stimpy people. I mean, his main color guy is Scott Wills, who got his start with Bill Ray doing backgrounds on Ren and Stimpy, and one of his main, I believe, character designers is Stephen DiStefano, who started an animation on Ren and Stimpy. He's yeah. pretty big in the comics world. And in the pretty high that's demand. Right. That's so. where I heard of his name first is through comics. Yeah. Do you think you'd ever write a follow-up book about these uh, other people involved and kind of their streams out from Ren and Stimpy? Because it sounds just fascinating from what you're telling me right now. What I wish someone would write is the history of the Warner Brothers animation in the 90s because there's a lot of interesting background there and some similar dynamics and politicization. And it would explain a lot about why the Steven Spielberg Animaniacs reboot is so late. But uh, I won't want to get into that. But it would it's kind of history repeating itself there but me personally i'm kind of done with the current industry most of my fascination has always really been with the classic golden years and right now i've been working with my partner and friend uh, charlie judkins on a history of the new york studios from Mm. the 20s to the 60s and because most of that history has been unwritten and those people are dead i mean let's face it it's safer to write about people who are not with us anymore because that was always because that was always the fear with sick little monkeys is like like i i almost paid an attorney to look at is like can you make sure no one can sue for this and but my publisher said yeah i don't see any issue with that and seven years to the date uh no formal complaints so i think i did okay okay Okay. and to kind of wrap this up what shows i guess in the last say 20 years would you say are animation shows that you that you enjoy that you think are you know holding this kind of animation golden age up or is there any Maybe there's none. I I don't really think there is. I think a lot of the business has gotten, you know, compartmentalized again. Too much of the work is being done automated. Mm. This is not a knock against anyone who uses digital, but because it can be done to do great things. I mean, anything I really like is independent, like just people doing things on their own time. But like, you know, I I don't watch a lot of modern animation because I don't like to get angry. So (laughs) yeah, I can understand that. I love the uh, Venture Brothers show. It just got canceled after, what is it, 20 years, seven seasons. And uh, yeah, I kind of don't really like the acrimony about that because, you know, it's like Adult Swim are the cheapest goddamn damn people on the planet and you, h- how did this last this long how did you get this you know you're doing something so high budget and i mean ren and stimpy even got with all of its acrimony at least got 50 episodes out in five years you guys got 80 out in like what was it 17 exactly <laughs> how are you expecting this to last as long as it did two years between a season sounds like <laughs> something like the john k wanted to do four episodes a year i think that's what your book said at some point that's what and, he uh, thought would be feasible yeah those guys are probably less combative with the people putting up the money so they're probably yeah. able to do it i i claim no insider knowledge on that production i okay. gotta say though all, all i know is just generalities and like i said adult swim being as cheap as it is i can't believe that this even existed will there be an audiobook version of uh, sick little monkeys allegedly there's been one in production for several years but and i only hear about it every couple of years but i, I heard tests and mp3s of it and i signed oh, okay. off on it but it never got released i don't know what the story is you also host your own podcast tell us a little bit more about it and how we can find you on- online well the podcast is cartoon logic and i co-host that with with uh, my friend Bob Jakes, who was the animation director on Ren and Stimpy. He's one of my friends. And we just talk about, you know, animation history, the classic cartoons of the golden years. And uh, yeah, just the people behind that, because so much of it is unwritten. And we've got a Patreon too, patreon.com slash cartoon logic, uh, shameless plug. And we're doing a year by year examination of the Fleischer Studio Popeye cartoons, which have, you know, everybody says they love them, but there's not a lot of information about how they were made or the people behind them. So, and that's what Bob has done a lot of his life is study these things and 
you know, find out uh, about these guys and meet them, and uh, which he did through the 80s and early 90s. I've learned yeah. there's a lot of animation podcasts out there as well. Is there any other ones that you listen to that you recommend my listeners to kind of uh, tune into besides Cartoon Logic? The main one is my friends Bob Mackey and Henry Gilbert. They do a Talking Simpsons podcast, okay. which examines the Simpsons chronologically. Well, no, see, they've, they're have they well past the golden years for that. They're in season 11 now. And I, I've i got to say, I, I, I much respect them because everybody stops talking about it around season eight. But they're <laughs> actually looking at it and they're dissecting why something might work and why something doesn't work. And they also did a spinoff podcast, a What a Cartoon, which... It covers more modern stuff than I would. Okay, Dad, thanks a lot for your time. People just love Loren Stimpy, and I, I want to make sure that people know that there is a book about the inner workings of the whole thing, and I think that's fantastic that you've written this book, and I really... And, you know, the whole, the whole question of separating the art from the artist, I mean, I've been doing that since age 16 with this show. I mean, once you find out about the artist, I mean, it's hard not to do so. You know, you just got to let the work stand on its own. All the stuff that Thad and I discussed, I put links to in the show notes of this podcast, as well as at thehyperroom.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let more Ren and Stimpy fans know about it by sharing it on your social media. My name is Casey Lau. Hear me talk to pop culture industry leaders on every episode of the Hyper Room podcast. And check out all the episodes on thehyperroom.com and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to get the latest updates. See you next time inside the hyper room. The hyper room. The hyper room.